idea of Honeypot was to switch the recruitment process away from kind of the recruiter having all the power to the candidate having all of the power. And the idea there was if we can give each developer who signs up to Honeypot X amount of potential interviews and then they can choose which company they interview with. This was the initial idea. From what I've seen of friends of mine who are developers and starting companies, I think the biggest obstacle is always this, this network. It's one of my big messages is like, just don't underestimate the power of building connections with people, of, of people who might seem like they don't necessarily have something to do with your company at that stage, but who might become interesting and important for you in the future. Originally, when I met my, my, my two partners, they were like, hey, are you a software developer? I'm, or can you program, I think was the question. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, cool, you know, let's talk. And so that's how it started. But then obviously I gradually changed into a bit more management, became the CEO of the company and ran the company for a couple of years. Uh, moved to Berlin in 2010 to uh, start um, another company, um, and uh, which then became the biggest food delivery platform in the world called Delivery Hero. I was running product and engineering there for a couple of years. At the core, I think I really like building stuff. With Cavalry, it's quite simple. It's uh, upfront, no bullshit. I myself had, a, had companies that succeeded greatly, went public. I had other companies that I had to close. So I know the spectrum, so do my partners. And that's how we sort of interact with our portfolio companies. You should always start with what problem do I solve for whom? Because that will allow you to sort of evaluate your potential solution in a very cheap way. We, we see that actually quite frequently where you have a case of solution is looking for a problem, right? So the solution has been built, but actually it has been just been built because they could without having any sort of customer or problem that you solve for a particular customer in mind. And I think that's clearly something that should be avoided because, you know, you might end up spending weeks or months building something that eventually no one wants. So Christian and I studied together and then we met again at Zalando where we sit next to each other uh, for, for quite some time. I joined the company very early on, um, founded the Zalando Lounge and then led product um, and Christian was the first CMO of the company. So we actually spent a lot of time together and then also started angel investing together. Um, and from that came the idea to, to basically build the fund that we would have liked to have by our side as founders and the beginning of Cherry. The team needs to be good in, in bringing on more people to the team that are really strong, that can help grow the company. I think that is a clear learning. You cannot start early enough with that uh, and, and recruiting more people once you've raised funding. That's also why, as, as Philip said earlier, why we have a team that helps in recruiting and helps bring on very strong people so that you can really grow. Right? And then I think they're on the journey, there's obviously many mistakes like not being focused, right? So as an entrepreneur, you always kind of, you know, you want to conquer the world and then there's an opportunity here and there and you want to do 10 things at the same time, but you should really rather think about, okay, where do I want to stand in a year and then work towards this, right? And don't get distracted too much left and right. And then it can be uh, a bit tricky. Yeah, but I think also if you're honest, also timing is important and sometimes you also need to be a little bit lucky. Um, so just to give you an example, um, our own Zalando story, I think was very much one of timing, right? Because it was at the end of the last financial crisis, all the markets were down, nobody was really spending a lot on marketing and Zalando seized that opportunity and developed like a very vocal, quite aggressive marketing campaign and that at the end led to uh, the growth of the company to a large extent. So. Um, probably in a different time that wouldn't have been possible. So while of course everything that Christian says is true, the team needs to be there, the idea needs to be big, uh, the ambition level needs to be there, um, sometimes you also need a little bit of luck. We help entrepreneurs uh, around the globe win big. 
And so one of the core focuses is also developers and developer-centric companies. I'm actually a developer myself. I started you know, very early in my childhood liking computers. Eventually I found out about venture capital. I thought it's the perfect combination of my passions about building things, investing, and technology. And I just thought it's uh, the best job helping people to build things. I mean, developers are an extremely scarce resource. Especially good developers are thought after by everyone. You can find a job in a great company that's going to pay you well and uh, you can live a very comfortable life. But at the same time, you also have the chance to start something on your own and to have a really, really big impact. Although in that path is obviously not the easiest path and a lot less comfortable. But I think some people have the drive and the potential just to, to start something on their own. You know, many of the uh, entrepreneurs or the great entrepreneurs in our portfolio, what they have in common is they worked in a specific sector and they have a lot of knowledge there. And they just saw a problem that nagged them that they have to solve. So look in your industry, what kind of problems are you maybe solving with a really repetitive thing and where could you, you know, find opportunity to start companies? Uh, that is really what I would encourage. Armed. It goes back to 1999 when I visited the valley for the first time and uh, the first night of my stay I had dinner at the Stanford uh, dining hall and I listened to a very charismatic speaker at the time. His name was Guy Kawasaki. He had been the chief evangelist of, of Apple working for Steve Jobs and I was a consultant at McKinsey. And during that night I realized that going forward I didn't want to work with the losers of tomorrow. I wanted to work with the winners of tomorrow. And I thought that, you know, internet would fundamentally change the world. So to make a long story short, I then started Crandom in 2002. And, you know, here we are today, uh, 19 years later. Um. If you look back at what made companies successful, there are oftentimes two things that, that stand out. Um, the first one is the obvious one. Everyone talks about it. it's the team, right? It is both the beginning, the team that's there in the beginning, but more importantly, it's the team that the founders were able to recruit in the following years. But one which is much more difficult to influence and oftentimes much more difficult to understand in the beginning is market timing. Are you in the right time in history trying to solve a problem. There were music streaming companies before Spotify with great teams, but the music labels were not ready to digitize their offering. What Daniel and his team did at Spotify was that they broke that glass ceiling that I think was hoovering above all of us saying that, well, you know, in Europe you can only build companies to a certain size. And if you want to go beyond that, you have to move to the Valley or to New York or somewhere. And they just said, screw that. You know, we're going to build it from here. But Spotify was our first big win. And today it may sound obvious, right? Who doesn't want to uh, listen to every single song you can on your, your iPhone or our iPad, wherever you are, right? Sounds pretty logical. But that was not the case at the time. And we were not the only ones to look at Spotify, even though I think we were one of the first ones. But what I think made the difference was that everyone drew the natural conclusion. Great team great product but hey let's wait until they've signed all the labels because then that risk has, has gone away and in our team uh, the discussion was uh, was led by frederick and was very much when they sign those labels there's going to be 100 firms that want to invest so let's let's instead follow them really closely so that when they're kind of 80 percent done that's when we pull the trigger and recommend the funds to invest. So especially in the case of Spotify, we at Creandum were around the founding team for one and a half years until we felt that the music labels are ready to take that risk, to digitize their offering and to allow it to offer it on a streaming platform. But in hindsight, we feel comfortable that joining Spotify was also a good amount of market timing.
vision of Peak Capital is being different than other VCs. I think when we started as Peak Capital 13 years ago, there wasn't a lot of VC money in the market at that time. And we thought that as entrepreneurs, we could really be different, the way that we look at companies, but also the way that we help companies. So that's the reason why we started Peak Capital as a true entrepreneurial fund. I think the best time to start your own company if you have a great idea and indeed have a great team in place to execute on that idea. And I think the timing will ultimately decide whether your company will be successful and that's mainly really related to speed. Because the market is these days so competitive with a lot of ideas popping up at the same time that you should be really fast in executing it. For developers, it's key to have your product out there as soon as you can. Because we learned that building a product takes a lot of time and especially building the last pieces of the product, let's say the last 20 or 30 percent, takes most of the time. And getting your product live earlier, so launching it at 70 or 80 percent out there in the market, will save you a lot of time, will increase the speed, but especially the last 20 or 30 percent will probably will be not needed. Because when you put it live, you will get feedback from your clients, from your users, and it will probably change your perspective. So we always push developers and CTOs to get their product live as early as possible. Number one is team. Uh, so to build a large company, it's a very cumbersome and, and hard process. So you need a team that is extremely passionate, uh, extremely driven, motivated, that can go through the roller coaster of entrepreneurship. So there will be many uh, good moments, but there will also be many bad moments where you think, okay, I'm running out of money or an important client just canceled, whatever, right? So there will be many tough situations. So you need a very, very strong team. Second of all, you need a market that is big enough to build a billion dollar company in that market. It can be a market that is still small today, but is growing rapidly, especially if it's a new technology, then this is usually what we see. And then third element is obviously a very good product um, or a business model that, uh, that works, that has or can have product market fit in the future, that is loved by, by customers um, that then really enjoy having this product, that are okay and spending uh, some money for this. That is, I think, the, the third uh, important point. I think the hard thing about the billion euro idea is that they're not very obvious in the beginning. Many times the largest companies and markets, they look kind of small and not obvious uh, in the beginning. And uh, the reason why this is so great for startups to tackle is that big companies have an inherent problem going after seemingly small markets. So that's why there's just not that much competition. And so if you're uh, a company basically making a market and really riding the tailwinds of a market that you're developing and that's really pushing you forward, then you can make a lot of mistakes and still grow. Either you build something really unique or if you're going after an existing market, you really have to be 10 times better because otherwise the, the cost to, to switching is just too high. It has a lot to do with how many lives are touched in a very significant way, be it in gaming, be it in the financial sector, be it in the property sector, in marketplaces or in digital health. As long as an entrepreneur is able to make the life of many people better, more efficient, or save a lot of money for companies that do things in a different way, people are willing to buy these products. Well, I think you know the, the basics on investing, the ABC, is to look at the team, the product or the service, and the market. Lots of great teams out there, lots of great ideas as well. But if you want a billion euro idea, you know, you have to be either in a very large market that you maybe can transform or you have to be in a really small market, social networks and Facebook, right? Where you almost build the market and you grow with that market. But in both cases, the end result have to be a massive market because otherwise it's not going to be a billion or a multi-billion euro idea. So there is this magical question, how do you get funding by a venture capitalist? It ultimately comes down to your idea and yourself and your team you've built around you. But that's obviously the second step. You first need to be in touch with one of the many venture firms, including Creandum. And getting in touch with someone who works as a venture capital firm is always easiest if you know someone working there. Or if you know someone who knows someone who works there. 
that's the easiest, right? But that means you need to have a certain network and that's neither fair nor, nor is it quite limiting to the people that we can speak to. So quite frankly, I react to cold LinkedIn, to Twitter DMs, I react to Facebook messages. I think the number one mistake that I get very annoyed about is if I get a cold email and I reply to you with feedback and then I realize you've sent the same exact email to every one of my colleagues, that's annoying. Right, so, so try to find the person who's best fitted for what you do, your business, your idea, within a certain venture capital firm, and then try to meet that individual, right? Instead of spamming everyone and hoping your shotgun approach is the best, because I can tell you it's not. But it's very important uh, for your viewers to understand that venture capital is a specialized product for a specialized type of company. And all those who don't get funding from one of the top VCs are not failed companies or failed entrepreneurs. They very often build successful companies, which at that time wasn't a fit for venture capital. I should raise venture capital when you're ready for it. And it means that your product is ready, that your team is ready, but also that you know the way how to scale. And when your product is not ready, I would build your product and build it from your own financial situation. And if you don't have that, try to find money from the government or try to find money from angels. And if you are, your product is live, but you don't have any traction yet, try to finance that also in another way. But if you really want to scale and if you really want to grow faster and you know the way that you can do that, then it's time to raise venture capital. When you have an idea to start a company, I think you should always really start with the founding team because that ultimately decides the success of your company. And we learned, especially as an early stage investor, that it's really important to have a complete founding team. And it means that you not should only have a technical guy or girl in the team, the hacker, but you also need a commercial person in the team, as we call it a hustler, really selling and marketing your stuff. And the third person we really learned to have in your team, that's the hipster. And that's a guy or girl who really thinks from a consumer perspective or from a client perspective and it's all about interfacing and how it works and how it's being perceived by the user. We learn that's really important to assess really early on the opportunity of a company. And we do that on a T-score model which consists of four T's, the team, the traction, the thesis and the timing. Don't underestimate storytelling in investment. This is something which is so, so important. It might be clear in your head, but you have to create the vision. And, and the question you should be asking is, what does the world look like with my product? And what does the world look like without my product? And finally, like with investors, you know, take it as colleagues or, or friends. You know, you should actually like them. <laughs> um, these are people that you will be on a journey with. They will be there during really, really tough times. You should feel like you can have a very good, professional, trusting, working relationship with them. So don't just take anyone's money. Make sure you're picky about who you, who you choose. You need to make sure that once you go out and raise money, that it's the first time that VCs hear of you. It's really bad if sort of you're the talk of town and everyone has heard about your company, but no one has invested uh, because then people lose interest because it's not the shiny new object anymore. The craziest is if a company says, we're currently not fundraising. If a company looks interesting, puts out interesting content, but is not fundraising, this all uh, contributes to building up a hype such that if you then start fundraising, lots of people are interested in it and you're gonna have uh, lots of good discussions. Venture funds that have their own thesis about what they wanna invest in, they don't ask you who else is investing because they don't care. Like if they like the business, they will invest. If they don't like it, they won't, regardless who else is investing. Venture funds that are a bit less sophisticated often ask like, so who else uh, are you talking to? Because for them, it's a proxy to validate whether this is a good or potentially good investment to make, right? So whenever you hear who else is investing, it should at least raise an orange flag uh, in, for the company that this investor might not be the most um, thesis driven investor. The question is always, um, what's the valuation of a company? It's very simple in a sense that a fund like Cavalry, an early stage fund, we're quite vocal about how much ownership we want. 
So we need 10 to 15% ownership of a company. Whatever we will invest, what makes sense for your company, if your company needs, let's say 1.5 million euro, we will give you 1.5 million euro and in return, we need 15% of the company. And that gives you the, the ownership or the, the valuation of the company. Because there's no, in my head, there's no other way for early stage companies to value because there's no revenue, no customers, no product. Early stage funds like us need a bit less ownership. Series A funds need more, like 20%, and later stage funds need a bit less again. And that's sort of the, the bell curve of ownership. It's really important for both the VC and the company to also spend some time with each other, be it via Zoom or, or in person, just to figure out, are we actually getting along? Truth of the matter is that if you raise money from Cavalry, as an early stage company, you'll probably see us for the next seven years. If possible, make sure that you, know, you find a, a partner that you also get along with on a personal level. I think it's super important to fit into a certain template that a VC can work with. Meaning, you need to have a deck, uh, you need to have your uh, financials, your P&L prepared. And so there's a few basic fundamentals that you just need to have ready. And that should, from a format perspective, fit somehow into what a VC expects. Because sometimes companies try to be special by coming up with some crazy way of presenting, but then that's incompatible with how a VC works. Just to give you a simple idea, VC all have CRM systems. So they like to get a PDF deck from a company, they pitch deck, they put it into the CRM, and then everyone can have a look at it. Let's say you send a YouTube video as a pitch, no one can put the YouTube video into the CRM and it will disrupt the disruption to the process of the VC. So don't try to stand out in terms of like sending a crazy deck or anything. Stand out in terms of your team, your idea, you know, the product that you've built, not the, the pitch deck that you send. Often or sometimes in pitch decks, you see that a company is, is raising venture capital money in you know let's say in the year 2000 and then in the year 2003 they pr the company plans to be profitable vcs don't like profitability particularly not early stage vcs of course your business model in general needs to be able to be profitable at some point in time but not in the next three years also not in the next five years typically profitable companies just don't grow quickly enough Right? So the idea is that you raise venture capital and the idea is to invest the money to grow. And, and you do this in a you know, seed round, early stage round, series A, series B, series C. So in the, in the first like seven years or so, the company is not expected to be profitable. The company is expected to grow with a business model that can then turn profitable at scale. Telling a VC that you're gonna be profitable in three years is a mistake, uh, particularly in early stage VC. Because if you think of how early stage works, you have a portfolio of let's say 10 companies. Out of these 10 companies, six are gonna go out of business, two are gonna do, do okay, and so two need to do amazingly well in order to return enough money to make up for all the other companies where you lost money. What you don't want is, is companies that are, are in the okay bracket. You want companies that do crazy well or that go out of business. As important it is to start a funding round, have a structured process and making sure that all VCs are somewhat kept in sync, once you have enough investors that agree to invest for the amount that you need, you need to make sure you get from there to actually getting the money on your bank account, right? Just because someone said we're investing, it doesn't mean that this will actually end up happening. So if an investor says, yes, we're gonna put in a million in your company, then try to wrap it up as quickly as possible. Make sure the excitement doesn't go away over the next two, three weeks, right? Make sure the process rolls and then just wrap it up as quickly as possible. Important to remember, you cannot convince VCs. The mind is made up quite early usually, and then the rest of the process is just about finding reasons not to invest. Sometimes as a company, you try really hard, but then it's almost it's, it's, waste of, it's a waste of time, right? You, either the VC hooks up immediately and you feel it like, okay, they come back to you within a day, right? Like they're really engaged and everything, then spend more time on it. But if, if you have to write follow-up emails and stuff, it's kind of a waste of time. <music>
um, about more technical teams coming to market and uh, developing their ideas. As a matter of fact, what we also believe is like developers and engineers within organizations will become the decision makers of what software is being used inside of companies. And I think the interesting part is like you see now engineers develop products for this target group. And um, at the end, maybe 10 years ago, or even five years ago, it was a CIO of the company or even the CFO that will make a decision on what software is being used. And we see that power shift towards the engineer, towards the development. So we are incredibly excited about sort of developer-led and developer-focused software, and we are continuing to make investments in that space. It's never been a better time to be a developer and to start a company. I think there's so much capital on the market chasing great ideas and great businesses. What we generally see is software is eating the world. We're only at the beginning of digitization in every market you can think of. If you look at the COVID pandemic, it seems like everything has just been accelerated. It's like you went into a time machine and you went 10 years ahead. You see it in the growth of, of digital companies and also how the whole society went through a pandemic um, you know, on the hood of digital companies. So while we all might think that the world is so digital already, if you have a close look, we're still pretty analog and still pretty offline. Government, construction, real estate in general, uh, but all the other industries. Look at groceries. We're at 2% online grocery penetration. That means 98% of the groceries are still being bought by people who push around cheese in metal cages. That's pretty analog. So in general, I'm, I'm very bullish on the tech industry and I think it's, it's just the beginning. You know, when I started my first company, it took me years and it cost me a lot of money. And these days it's really cheap to start your company because you don't need a lot of money because everything is available right now. Offices, tech, in the cloud, etc. So I think that's really great. There's a lot of money in the market also, so you can raise easily a lot of money. But it also means there's a lot of competition because the same idea that you have as a founder, probably also a lot of other people have. And they also can raise funding easy. So it's all about speed and it's all about execution. I think give it 10 or 20 years, I don't think we will talk about the tech industry anymore. And this actually goes back to how I thought about this 20 years ago or, or you know, 23 years ago when I got into this industry. The combination of, of internet and, and software will transform the whole globe. I think it will transform every portion of GDP. Uh, it will just be an enabling technology for everything. With some companies like Google, Facebook and others getting to the scale that they do, we suddenly have these ethical questions around you know, responsibility, power, control that large tech companies have. It is really scary, this kind of consolidation of, of power amongst a very small number of companies. Tech is in a certain way starting to get a reputation like big pharma or, or big oil. This trend towards big tech is something which I am not <laughs> positive about. You know, while I respect the growth of, of those, those companies, I do think that we all have an ethical and a moral obligation. I would like to see rivals to Amazon, rivals to Google, rivals to Facebook. The potential for, you know, someone in their bedroom to start a, a small project and it have impact can actually still be a reality in 10, 20 years. I don't want that special feeling of, you know, being able to build something and have impact to go because the tech industry has become so monopolized by such a small group of companies. So my hope for the future is that that ability continues in tech and that our kids still have that feeling of the magic that can come from creating something in your room and seeing hundreds of thousands of people using it.